Good morning, Catalyst. It's good to have all of you here with us today. We're starting a new sermon series, obviously, because we had the cool entrance song. So we wanted to uh, let you guys know we're doing a little something different today. Over the next few weeks, we're going to switch up what we're talking about. We're going to uh, try to help us dial in on who we are and how God made us to be um, as a church family, but also individually, what, are, what parts we should play. But to understand that, you got to understand who you are. Now, here's the secret about me that I'm sure won't surprise many of you, and, and you probably also have this secret. When I was younger, I had a fake ID, right? Like, I mean a fake ID that came from the DMV. I went down, had my picture taken. They sent it to my buddy, put all of his information with it. He lived two doors down. He was like, Scott, I got your ID. Got me into everywhere you wanted to go. Had my picture on the ID. Like, there, like it was as real as it comes. Now, I had, it had my picture but it had information about me that was not me, right? Like, so you, like, you get, get to know the information real well, probably better than any of us know. I mean, how many can, like, your driver's license number right off the top of your head. But when you got that fake ID, you know them all, right? You know, like, you got to know every number. It's like, okay, that seems a little bit different. And I'm sure I'm not the only person here who at one time had a fake ID. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room. The problem is some of us still have that fake ID, now, some of you, like, like you put it maybe like for memory's sakes, which there's no reason to have it for memory's sakes, but here's what I'm talking about. Some of you have bought into some things that other people and maybe even yourself have started thinking is true about you that are not true about you. It looks like you, but the information is just wrong. And we have started buying into this, this fake self, this fake personality, and because we have done that, we're not able to experience the wholeness of what God has for us. Because God made us to be us, right? Like, like we, there's this optimized self of us when we're, when we're making the best decisions, doing the best that we can, all of the above. And then there's this like, I'm still puttering by, but I know who I am and I know who God made me. And then there's this, I bought into this fake idea about, about who I believe that I am that I'm not about who others think that I am and I'm not, and I've let them think that about me because I started thinking these fake things about me. But it's not who God made me to be. It's not how he made me to be. And that's one of those things like we've got to figure out. And, and in this sermon series, I hope to help us dial in and understand um, how to have a better relationship with God, how to see ourselves as our true selves, not the fake identity that so many of us have bought into over the years, and it really just slows us down, because here's the thing, God, God made you to be a certain way, and he made you to be a certain way, and he made certain things for you to do, he created us, he knew us when we were in our mother's wombs, and we've got to recognize if we are not playing the role that God made us to play, like everything around us isn't functioning the way that it should, because we're not playing this role, and I mean in the good and the bad. Like, there are some things about me that, like, I just shouldn't be doing because God's like, yeah, we need you to have a team around you, so we're going to make you bad at a bunch of these things. Like, there's, like, two things over here you're good at. The rest of them, we're like, can you pass those off to somebody else because you're not so good at those things. Um, but all of us have to realize that's what's going on. I said last week, I took a quote from Jim Simbala, and he said, talking about God and not experiencing God's power is not what I want. And it's not what I want for you, it's not what I want for me, it's not what I want for your kids, it's not what I want for our church family. I want us to be able to experience God in a way that like, it changes who you are. It takes you back to your real identity, who God made you to be, the reason he made you to be, for the purpose he made you to be. It takes us back to there. It kicks start and gets maybe all of the the webbing, the, the things that are holding us down, they've got us buying into, well, this is who I am, and, and this is who everybody thinks that I am, so I've got to be this person, but you're not. God made you to be a different way. And I'm not the smartest person in the room, but what I do know is that since others have had this intimate, uh, powerful relationship with God, it's possible still for you and me. So when I look at this, I'm, the more I read scripture, the more I see these people who had this intimate, close love relationship with God. And because they had it, I believe as I start looking at some of these people, some of these things start lining up. 
Like the things that Elijah did and Elisha and Moses, uh, a lot of the prophets and stuff. Uh, We see Peter and John and a lot of them did the same things. And because they did the same things, in my mind, like I'm a visual guy, most of us are crazy visual men, what I realize is they're probably these worn paths. That if we pay attention, they all did the same things, they all went the same way, and if I do those things and go the same way, I'm going to discover this new power. We've got these old paths and this new power. But when I say new power, I mean like, hey, uh, I bought a car. It's like, oh, is it a new car? It's a new-to-me car, right? Like, like it's, it's got like 30,000 miles, or I know some people are like, I'm looking for a car, but I know it doesn't get broken until at least 100,000 miles It's like, well, I think that's a little crazy. It seems like a lot of miles to like go looking for, but we have some of those crazy people around here. I love those crazy people, but we've got to realize like the new power has always been there. You're discovering the power that God has always had that other people have known that somehow you've missed. So all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got this new power. Uh, That's been around for a while. (laughs) You just didn't discover it. You didn't recognize it was going on. So I'm hoping that this series helps us get to that place because what we've got to realize is that there are these two options that are coming, right? We can choose to seek God. We can choose to make everything else secondary and our relationship with God primary. And if we do that, you know, our our family lives will be better. Our jobs will be better. uh, Our relationships will be better. Our marriages will be better. All the above. It's not like I've got to do this and everything else gets bad. That's not how this relationship with God works. When you get this right, everything else gets better. But if we choose not to have that relationship, there are two options, it seems like to me, for moving forward. We will either be in a recession or a revival. And by recession, I don't mean financial recession. People will talk about that all the time. When I, when I talk about recession, I mean a continual, gradual recession of biblical Christianity. Slowly but surely, we will work our way away from God and not even know that we got there. And I hate that I even have to say biblical Christianity because if it's not Bible-based, if it's not Bible-rooted, it's not Christianity. I don't care how nice you are. If it's not rooted in the Bible, it's not Christianity. But now we've got two terms, Christianity and biblical Christianity. It's like I don't know who came up with this one, but I want to sort of smack him in the mouth. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So we have the option for recession or revival. Now, if you've been in the church very long, like, this is one of those words that's like, ooh, I like revival. Like, let's have some more of that, please. It just makes sense. But when I talk about revival, I want to talk like, I want to understand revival as a fresh work of God that is not manufactured by any one person tweaking the system, finding the, the secret, right? If, if you have been to uh, different conferences, uh, Christian conferences and stuff like that, if you've been to any of those, they have worship and the worship, it builds. And if you, if you talk to some people who have studied worship, they studied the system of worship, they can tell you first song needs to be at you know, 120 beats per second. The second one needs to be at this many beats per second. And, and, then, or, or, and then this one's got to go here. And then we drop it down. Then we bring it back up. And they like, they manage our emotions. Now, they also create a culture for us to follow after God. But they can also be manipulating the system. They can make it emotional. And now emotions are part of following God. I'm not saying that. But when you're tweaking the system to get people where you want them to go, that's not revival. When you are just following closely after God and that happens, you still have the same feeling. You still have the same, but what you're doing is it's not being manipulated by somebody else. It's being empowered by your relationship, your closeness to God. And I think that is the goal. Like having a close relationship with God, having access to all of this power and And everything that we should do should be the goal. And and if we are close to God, Sunday morning attendance, like we don't even worry about that. Obviously, I'm going to be there because it gives me an opportunity to connect with God and other people in a way that I can't do by myself. Reading the Bible, you know, praying, serving, giving, like all that stuff is like, it's an offshoot of my closeness to God. When you try using 
Bible study, which is good, worship, good, church attendance, good, serving good, giving good, all of that as a way to get to God, often we hit the ceiling. Because he's like, if you're not close to me, those are just things that you do. But if you're close to me, my power runs down through all of those things. And they mean more. They, they are a tool to draw us nearer and closer together. So we've got to understand like the revival is, it is initiated by God. And, and revival is this, is this super Christian word. And we've seen revivals all over. Uh, we've seen them recently. Um, and then we, you look back through history, you can see there's a plot thing called the Great Revival and the Second Great. Like there are things you can read about revivals. And if you look at these, we see that there can be these um, qualities, these actions that are taken to help set up the hearts and minds of the people so we align with God. And when we do that, it's like we open this highway of God's power to show up rather than these little paths that God's sneaking in with. And when he shows up, big things start to happen. You're like, whoa, I don't know what I think about that. Like that challenges my faith a little bit. That's probably pretty good. <laughs> it's got to stretch us a little bit. Is it in line with the Bible? Is it in line with the Holy Spirit and what God's been doing? And, and now we can figure this out, right? But I know when I hear the stories and I see the news of what's going on in the world today, revival isn't the word that I would use. It would be the other. It would be recession. And when I do this, I'm like, God, what would you want us to do? How do we get back to this? How do I get myself back to it? How do I get my family back to it? How do I get my church back to it? What does this look like? And it's like, oh, this isn't all that new. So let's think about where we are as a society. And, and does this sound familiar? This is Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So this is Solomon here in his later days. And it says, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless, which is fun, but thankfully we don't stop there. What do people gain from all of their labors at which, uh, for the toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets, and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows... Uh, to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever turning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams come from, they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. The ear never is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. When I read this, I'm like, I can never see too much. Like you get a good thing, you're like, well, if, if this is good, then so much more is great, right? I can never hear enough good things. I can never hear enough of, of the gossip, of what's going on in the world, of, of good things or bad things. We always want more. It always has to be bigger, better, and faster in the United States. And when we follow that, it ends up being meaningless. The sun rises and the sun sets. All the streams, they, they flow into the sea, but it's never full. It, it's almost like God's like, okay, I'm, if you stop wanting to play around and you really want to get serious about this, we can figure this out because sometimes I feel like Solomon here. What is this all about? But thankfully, there are other scriptures. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he is the same back then when Solomon was writing this, and he was the same in the New Testament when Jesus was actually with skin on earth here running around, and he is still the same today, I've got to believe that I can have the type of relationship with the God of the universe, with the Son of God, that all those other people also had. So how do I do that? How do we get to the place to where we, we are able to strip off all of these things that we started believing about ourselves, this false self, this fake ID. How do we get rid of these things so that when I engage God, it's in his purest form and I'm able to understand him a little bit more and I'm able to 
um, be optimized in my relationship with him. It is just the best that it's ever been. And, I'm, and I found an answer, and I don't think it's the only answer. I'm sure there are more, but I was looking here in a book that all of us read every day, Second Chronicles. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to the table of contents. I hope Scott puts that on the screen. Can I just Google that? Because I don't know where Second Chronicles is. Is that a book of the Bible? What, what, I don't know what to do with that. That's, that seems really weird. Welcome to Catalyst Church. We're going to be in Second Chronicles today. <laughs> And we're going to be starting in verse 13, chapter 7, verse 13. Put this one down. Go home and check this out for yourselves. And we see here, when I shut up the heavens and there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send a plague among my people. Let's stop there because that sounds like a fun place to stop, right? Why in the world will we be reading this? And we've got to, to understand our scripture, we've got to understand who he's talking to and why he's talking. He's talking to the Israelites who have just come out of Egypt and they've seen plagues devour the land and plagues among the people. They have seen the heavens shut up with no rains. Like they know this, they have lived this, their parents told them about it. They know this so well. But what's happened is the Israelites have problems in their daily lives. I'm trying to figure out how to have a better family, how to make a little bit more money, how to be a little bit happier. How do I do that? I wonder if I start worshiping this God and this God and this God and this God. I will find anything that I can to solve my problems for today, and it made them wander away from God. And they didn't know they were doing it, I don't think. It was just a slow process that when they look up one day, they're like, how do we get here? How am I worshiping all of these other things, my job, my team, my spouse, my kids, me, my church, my whatever it might be, how in the world did I put all of those in front of my relationship with God? That's where these guys are. And he's reminding them, guys, it was one generation ago or two generations ago that this happened. And he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So it seems like when I read this, I'm a little slow on the uptake sometimes. I'm like, God, if you want me to get this, I'm going to need some action items. I need like, don't just think about this. Scott, do this first and then this second and this third, then we'll be better. I'm like, thank you, Lord, because you know how you made me. I'm all kinds of messed up, right? So we start here in verse 14. And this, like, you can't miss this. There, this maybe is the most important part of everything that's going on. If my people who are called by my name, he didn't say we were great people. He didn't say we had this great power. He said, you are my people. I called you by my name. You are my responsibility. I will take care of you. I have big plans for you. I want you to take over all of this stuff. I want to have such a good relationship with you that other people see it and say, I've got to know what they know. I've got to do what they're doing. I've got to be who they are. If you are my people called by my name, God recognizes he's doing all the heavy lifting for us. He is trying his best to involve himself in our lives and we keep cutting him off over and over again. So if we can get back to being his people who are called by his name, then we can start into this process. But you've got to know that you were bought by his blood. You have got to know that when you decide to follow Jesus, you need to make that the, most, the largest part of your priority that you've got going on. You are my people called by my name. God's like, you belong to me. My last name is on the back of your shirt. People talk about you can't... Uh, uh, take the Lord's name in vain, and I always say it's cussing. Or down south, you say cursing, which up north, it's like that's what a witch does. Cussing is what you know boys do when they're hanging out together. Cursing is what witches and brew pots do and stuff. It's just it's really weird to me down here that, that it's cursing. But you're like, okay, I never took the Lord's name in vain. If his name is on the back of your shirt and you're not living in a way to glorify him, you're taking his name in vain. Every time, it's like, yeah, that's sort of a body shot. <laughs> that one hurt a little bit. Like, I'm just not saying certain words. It's like, but are you living your life right? Ooh, that's, that, that's a bit harder. But he goes on. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. 
Boy, in the United States, not a value we're looking for, right? We need bigger, faster, stronger, better. Or humble yourself. It's like, yeah, can I choose no on that one? I don't like, I don't like humble. I know that the, the times in my life that I have been humbled most, it comes from humility because I have done or said something stupid and everybody's like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, that's me. That, that's mine. But we've got to realize that maybe this place where our, the United States is, where our world is, maybe that's our doing. We decided we can make good decisions. We can, the culture is changing, so I can go ahead and I can decide this is where we need to go and how we need to treat people and what we need to do and what we need to value. And somehow we're in this place in our world. It's like, I don't like my kids being raised in this world. So we've got to own that we have made it this way. And there's got to be some humility going along with that. And if you can calm yourself down and think just a, a little bit more about God, it's not about you coming down, it's about prioritizing God and putting him above where you are. If you can do that, then we can move forward a little bit more. And he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Let's talk about prayer first. It's one of those things that God has been like beating on me for probably the last year or so. When I talk to you about praying, I talk to you about not the ever-growing list of needs that I'm going to God saying, please help with this, please help with this, please watch over this person, protect this person, guide this person, give us this. It's just a, a Christmas wish list. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is spending time alone with God where my heart becomes more like his heart. Where, where the alignment of our hearts becomes the same. What hurts his heart hurts my heart. What he values, I value. And they've got to start lining up. But this doesn't happen without effort and work. This doesn't happen as I'm praying on my way to work and we're, and we're good. And I'm praying in the car because i got two seconds. Those are good things. If that's the only time you're praying, let's look at everything else you value in your life. You put it in your schedule and you schedule around it. Do you have a calendar place for this? Is this saying, I will make sure that this is, I'm going to do this at this time. For me, what I'm starting to do is, first thing I hit the office. So it's different times of different days, but first time I sit down, this is what I'm going to do. Can you make prayer a priority? Can you sit and listen to God? The other thing that I do, or, or I don't do, is I don't pray in my head anymore. Because when I pray in my head, I end up like, thank you, God, for today. You've been so generous and so grateful, and I'm loving that you're doing that, and I love Wes's shirt, and I wonder how he got that shirt, and I wonder if I could get one of those shirts, too. Where did he get that? I got to talk to him afterwards, and maybe we can go to the store together, and all of a sudden, I'm like, how in the world did I get here? I was praying. How in the world, like, me and Wes are going shopping together? I don't, he doesn't even know, but we're doing this. I don't understand how that happened. So if I want to dial in and pray a little bit more, me and my ADHD self, surprise, surprise, I got to write things down. So I write down the things that I'm, like I'm talking to God. Like, just like I'm talking to God, I write it down, and that keeps me a little bit more dialed in. And when things start to happen, I can go back and look and say, I prayed about that one time, and God answered that prayer. And then I want to pray a little bit more because I get to see the answer to prayer. So this is a good deal. We've got to understand it's not just our, our wish list here. But he says, when, you, when the people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will forgive them and I will heal their lands. When you seek his face, the, this Greek word here, when it talks about seeking your face, it, you know, even the, the Hebrew word here, it talks, it's not a single time. Well, I asked and they didn't show up. It's, I keep seeking until things are found. In the New Testament, it says, ask, seek, knock. It gives us action words like, how are we supposed to follow Jesus? Ask about it. So we need to keep asking until we get an answer. And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not right now because you ain't ready for it. Or they're not ready for it or whatever. But we need to keep asking. Keep, keep seeking until it happens. If we keep seeking, we keep asking, we keep knocking until someone answers, until we get the answer. 
And you might not like the answer. But as I'm seeking and I'm asking and I'm knocking, I'm getting so close to God that I, I know his heart. I can feel his presence. There's something palpable. Like, it's, it's just mature. It's, it's overwhelming. It's heaviness of his relationship with him. Then things begin to change. He says, you need to pray and seek my face. And then you need to turn from your wicked ways. <laughs> Me? Psh, I don't know if you know, like, I got my stuff together. I've been following Jesus for a long time. He's like, isn't that cute? Dude, I see you everywhere. I see your thoughts. I see, oh, oh whoa, wait a second. What do you mean you see my thoughts? Like, that, that's, off, that's off topic here, God. And he's like, no, no, all of the above. We need to realize that we're doing things wrong. <sighs> you are doing things wrong, period. I know that about all of us. I'm not saying it's just you, but you are doing things wrong as a father, as a mother, as a brother, as a son, as a, as a leader in your group, as a pastor. Like, I know I'm doing things wrong. So when I humble myself and I pray and I seek God's face, I need to stop doing the things. He's like, Scott, you know what you're doing wrong, dude. Stop it. And then I got to choose how important is that to me? Is it more important to, to be close to God and have that relationship with him? Or is it more important for me to be in control of what I think makes me happy and what I think makes it for a good life. But he gets here. He says, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then. That's what I circled this time as I was reading in my Bible. Then, there's an order to things. When you guys do your part, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. If do you want things to change? Do you want them to start heading in the right direction? In your family, in your community, at your job, in the world, here in Greensboro? Then I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. But he's like, guys, I, I need you to do a few things first. I need you to, do, you need to know that you are my people, called by my name. You need to humble yourselves. You need to pray. You need to seek my face rather than like it shows up every once in a while, but you're seeking it all the time until you get the answer. And then turn away from your wicked ways. Stop doing those things that are placing distance in between us. And then I will forgive your lands and your sin, and I will heal your land. If you want to experience God's power, if you need to experience God's power. As a church, I want us to experience God's power, not just talk about it so often. I want to I want to have those stories remember when remember when God showed up that time, when it happened to this person, when when this life was changed, when whatever it might be, I want to have those stories to tell because I'm so close to God that our church is so close to God, but I can't do this on my own. You have also got to turn. You've got to pray. You've got to seek. You've got to humble yourselves. And then God will do his job. Will you pray and seek God's face until you experience him? Until his heaviness weighs upon you? Will you, will you go with me this week into that experience, taking those actions to get rid of this false self that you've been living in for so long that God didn't create you to be. He didn't ask you to be this, that you created as some sort of facade because you're afraid of people finding out who you are. Will you go with me in this week into this? Will we be a people here at Catalyst that seek God first and get rid of all the rest of the stuff so that we can experience the power of God in ways that we never have before?